in search of soil. When you think about that direction that ag's moving in, the regenerative ag movement, and you think about some gaps in knowledge, are there areas that you think are particularly interesting and deserve a lot more research that maybe don't get talked about enough and that's where you maybe want to take your career, not just now, but over the next 10, 20, 30 years? Mm -hmm. Yeah, for me, I, I think that, and maybe it's just my own personal timeline of experience with this, but I feel like there's a lot more interest or change in direction with a lot of farmers looking more at biological aspects of the soil ecosystem rather than seeing it just as a thing that plants grow in and you add your nutrients in water and that's what makes it grow. To, to start seeing that as this really complex microbiological community and all of the, the complex interactions and results of that, um, I think is, is where I want to go. I want to start, start really trying to understand the things we can't see in the biology. Um, like what, what is happening as far as say nitrogen cycling or nutrient cycling capabilities on a molecular level, how is that influenced by the way that we manage farmland from tilling and cover crops to other synthetic versus um, more organic or natural soil amendments, things like that. Like what do, what do chemicals do to the actual microbes, the ones we know and the ones that we don't know, what's happening to that ecosystem as a whole um, and how does that relate to the outcome that farmers are looking for in their yield and their productivity and their bottom line. You know, it's, it's easy for me being kind of a nerdy scientist in the lab to say, oh, I want to do all this stuff. But in reality, like this is the farmer's livelihood and their, you know, how, how they live, their bottom line, their entire life depends on all this stuff. So I can't just say, oh, let's try this without really having kind of evidence to show that it can be a benefit. So um, that's really interesting to me. And I want to go into it in a way where, where I can continue to, to slowly start learning how this goes at a rate that makes people that want to get into it comfortable as well. You know, I, I don't want to yeah. go in and be like, oh, we need to do this to make this happen because I feel like there's so much that we don't know yet that that's really hard to, to be able to say any kind of claim like that. I think there's still, well, maybe not still, but now two camps in agriculture. You, you do have that conventional school, which is more chemical tillage based. And then you have the regenerative side of things, which is no-till, cover crop, you know, more let nature handle things. And, and I'm with you. I think a lot of times you can't prescribe solutions without a lot of that data behind them, without a lot of knowing behind them, because ultimately the people you need to adapt these solutions who can make the big changes in agriculture, you're 100% right. This is how they earn their livelihood. And they're not going to mm -hmm. literally bet the farm on something that might be true. And if it goes yeah. wrong, I mean, from they're the hearing ones- it from, Hearing it from someone who's not a farmer, you know, I, yeah. I do not have a farm. I am not a farmer. So, so that's a hurdle that I have to overcome every time I start doing work with anybody here in South Carolina is I have to, to show them that while I, I, this isn't what I do for a living, I've learned enough about it and I'm, I'm kind of partnering with them on this and hearing them and like, how do we together figure out how to, to have the outcome you want without any of the negative aspects that you've seen and you're trying to get rid of. Is there maybe one view that really stands out that's like say a traditional long held view in ag <clears throat> that you have farmers question or have they they stumble when they say oh i don't know if i want to try that when you're the scientist and, and they're saying hey no this is going to work this is going to work and they're like it just it's a paradigm shift for them it doesn't agree with how they've done things but the regen ag movement starting to go in that direction is there something that really stands out is it tillage is it you know, reducing chemical usage? Is it removing fallowing? Is there one of those that is just really deeply held? I, I think, you know, everybody has different kind of resistances to those different things, but the one that definitely stands out that I think it's the most pushback or that people kind of have more of a wall up against changing, in my experience, would definitely be tillage. And, and I don't know if it's, you know, that's just the 
kind of the way that it's always been, the way that they, they've always done it, their dad or their granddad always did it. Um, and, and I think some of that experience comes from if you maybe for whatever reason, there was a season where they couldn't till because of weather conditions, it was too wet or something like something happened that, that maybe they weren't able to, or they didn't get to it. And then they see other problems like weeds come up and things like that. Um, and so that it kind of confirms that mindset that they have to do it or this other problem is going to happen. Yeah. But if you kind of go into, into the no-till practice the proper way and with the proper expectations, you'll kind of know what to expect over time and what to do to maybe stop from having the weeds come up you know more than you what you would seen if you would have tilled it you know or how to how to kind of reduce your weed pressure without having to go in and till it but um i think that's the tillage in general is definitely the one that that even guys that I've, i feel like i've started to see their minds and the way their brains tick really change in a lot of aspects will still kind of like talk about oh maybe i'll go in and, and disc this and that and it's it just seems to be the hardest thing for some of them to really let go of yeah, i think the whole tapering expectations thing is huge i mean we're just we're just getting into nfl football season starting and a lot of fans and teams you know <clears throat> they put these unrealistic expectations on certain players or certain teams that might not be that good you know to begin with and they're just non-realistic to begin with if you think about going no till what are reasonable expectations that a farmer should think about when starting that system, making that conversion from tillage to no-till? Um, I don't really think there's a way you're going to be able to do it immediately without seeing some weed pressure, but that's okay. You know, like there are other ways that over time, if you implement cover crops at the right time and don't have a fallow period, um, and then the following season after a cover crop, or, or even after, depending on what your cash crop is, learning to leave some residue to kind of shade out weeds and start that competition um, is the, a big thing for me that it's kind of, you can't just immediately go no-till and then immediately have all the benefits of no-till that there's kind of a, a timeline that you've got to be aware of. And, and it's definitely not a concrete timeline like, oh, after your, your first season, you can expect this or this. It, it's totally variable depending on, on people's operations. But um, I mean, you really have to go in with a f kind of a flexible mindset, knowing that you're going to make a change and that's not the only change you're going to have to make. Like when you make that change, that other obstacles are going to come up and they're all solvable, but you just may have to kind of continue to think differently. Like, okay, this is a problem now. Like what is a way that I can solve weeds or whatever the other problem may be without disking everything up again you know there are plenty of other people now and in, in in the days of podcasts and social media there are plenty of ways for people to get on and see what other folks have done that have been successful and what hasn't been successful and and you have to be i don't know a little experimental on your own right when you're doing it from where you sit what's your view in terms <laughs> of academia and science when it comes to no-till i think there's you know peer reviewed a farmer is going to see what his neighbor's doing how well it's working for him and he's going to maybe make a decision based on that and then some people are also going to be like well show me the science it's one thing to say this is a good idea it's one thing to suggest it and hypothetically it makes sense on paper but is the science there from your vantage point when you think about no-till where do you think the science is right now in terms of substantiating or failing to substantiate its benefits? Um, I guess there's kind of two sides to that. Um, in, in kind of reading in my experience with the science, there's plenty of experiments in science that's been done in the short term that may not show the greatest benefits of it. But when you start to look at studies that are longer term, and involve not just till and no till, but but kind of coupling that with other more holistic or regenerative management practices. That's when you begin to see the real benefits from it. 
So if you if you go online and you find a, a research paper or an article or, or um, a magazine article, something that is just looking at a season or two of tilling versus no tilling with without any other kind of coupled um, variables in there, there's it's probably not going to look very good for the no till side of things. But if you start to look at the the more holistic picture of if you're starting with no-till and kind of the next steps of of using cover crops and and paying more attention to fertilizer use and things like that over a you know multiple seasons of time that's when you're going to start to see the results showing more benefits from not just the no-till but the no-till and the other practices that start to come along with it once you start to kind of get your toes wet in the regenerative practices I think. And, and as far as, as farmers, you know, you've got your kind of peer pressure, not peer pressure, but um, kind of peer review, like their neighbors and other farmers that they're seeing and, and the ability for them to access things online as well. Um, I've definitely noticed that it, it tends to be the younger farmers that I work with that are much more aware of resources available to them online um, and then there's there's some of the older guys that we work with that that literally a reason that that a couple guys would not cover crop a field that we were kind of suggesting that they they ought to is because it was right next to the a church i don't know if it's a church they went to or not but the people or the congregation at this church would have kind of been, I don't, I don't want to say judgmental, but would have noticed that their field wasn't fallow in the winter and kind of, it would have kind of got people talking about them and they just didn't want to have that happen or have people kind of judge the way that they're doing things or see that they're maybe doing things differently. So they didn't, they didn't shift, maybe they have now, this is a few years ago, but they didn't shift that field into cover crop use because of, of a kind of peer pressure issue. And if we, if we look at some of these views that people have where they're, they're strongly held, like say they're anti no till and they don't do cover cropping there, they follow that fallow strategy and they till. <clears throat> and maybe that's just because that's the way they've always done it. That's the way the generations before them did it. And like you said, maybe they're not looking outside of other resource at other resources to do otherwise, but then also they're weighing you know, the risk of trying something different. If I do it, maybe it doesn't work. Based on your research and stuff that you've seen in the field, do you think that the perceived risk of going to a no-till cover crop strategy in terms of field management versus a tillage fallow strategy is as risky as perceived? Or do you think that it's potentially individuals perceiving it to be riskier than it is. And if they were to make that conversion, we know enough now to say that results are probably going to be pretty good over the longer term, thereby, I don't say negating, but mitigating that perceived risk that you had up front. Yeah, it's like a like a long-term investment kind of thing or longer-term investment, and you have to be conscious of that kind of scenario. Yeah. Um, I mean, as a scientist, I can see that, but I, you know, I'm not a farmer again. So, so I can definitely see that they do see that risk. And sometimes I think when we say terms like regenerative agriculture, that when people talk about making that switch, that it, it maybe is a mindset of you have to, it's not just trying one thing and adapting as you go, that you have to change all of these things at once to go from conventional to regenerative and and making kind of multiple changes large scale changes at once is scary it's scary for anybody whether you're farming or not um, and so one way that we've or one project that we have going on right now that's kind of really seen success in overcoming that it's called the cover five project and we've got i think 10 or 11 farmers here in south carolina throughout the state and and we basically you know, got in contact with them because they had some level of interest in, in either trying something different or were fed up with 
the way that they had been doing things that weren't successful. Um, and so they let us come in and we basically were, were kind of like, give us up to, or show us up to five acres of the poorest land that you have that you can't get anything to grow on. And we're going to help you manage that land and provide you cover crop seed for three years. With the equipment you have, there's no new equipment you need to get, nothing else. Like we're going to work with you with what you have. We'll give you cover crop seed and show you what kind of changes can happen over three years in this process. And the, the first time that we went out, so many of these people, you know, they were open to it and letting us do it, but you could tell that there was a lot of skepticism in, in trying something different. So we started it in uh, November of 2017, I believe, with a cool season cover crop. And um, I think it was like a six, six way mix. I can't remember exactly what it was, but these guys planted it and we gave them up to five acres worth to put in, put in their crappiest spot. Um, and we went back again a few months later in February or March and, and re-met with them and kind of got opinions. And it was unbelievable with some of them, how just seeing something grow, even though it wasn't a cash crop, seeing something grow on land that they had struggled with for some of them have had that out of production for 10 years. Like the, their perception totally changed. And they're like, oh, I want to do this over in this other area too and here and there. So um, that was a big learning step for me too in that just kind of nudging people with like little baby steps. Like try, try this one or two things on this little part of your operation. See what happens. And then if you want to scale it up, you can scale it up. You don't have to make the transition from conventional to regenerative all at once. It's not a big step. You don't have to totally dive in. Just like, you know, kind of dip your toes in first, see what's going to happen. And it may not be the greatest thing. It may not be what you expect, but it's probably going to be something, a new experience that you can learn from one way or another. And then you move forward from that. How many people ended up participating in that program? Um, we started out with nine and I think now it's up to 11. We just had a few more that kind of hopped on later. And that's, that's really all that I, I think we, when we wrote the grant, um, it was an NRCS grant. It was for up to 12. And so we were almost at kind of our limit. And so um, that was a big part of kind of the field work aspect of, of my dissertation. And I, I still, we're, we're three years in. Um, we got an extension to get it through April of next year so that we can have three full years of cool season and warm season cover crop data. And all throughout this whole process, we've been taking soil samples and plant tissue samples and, and showing these people all their data and trying to help them interpret that data as well. Um, but still, every time I go out and visit these guys, I learn something new too about their operations and about um, kind of their journey and it's just really interesting to see how in three years time people's perspectives have changed dramatically and not everybody is is you know as dramatic but it seems like everybody that's involved um is really on board with continuing at least cover cropping and, and some of the practices that we've done but it's it's really exciting to see guys doing their own research now and, and kind of calling, calling me up and being like, Hey, I read this, you know, should I try doing X, Y, or Z instead of, of just kind of waiting for me to show up and being like, okay, what do I do next? You know, right. were, were those nine now 11 farmers? Was it like, say somebody gave you five acres originally, has that same five <clears throat> acres been part of this program since 2017, assuming the farm got in early? Or is it like yes. five acres? Okay. So can you, can you run through some examples of how you've seen, say, soils change on particular blocks that have really shown tremendous change, like plant tissue analysis? What have you seen there? So how has this actually proved out when you look at the data? Um, the plant tissue, there wasn't anything that really stood out. Um, and I got to say, it's, we've been relatively inconsistent on when we get tissue samples, too. Um, from cover crops because we're some guys have gone all in after the first season and we're like okay I'm going to take this out of production and I'm just going to cover crop cool season and warm season for all three years but other people were working with them and putting cover crop in during their normal fallow periods in their normal crop rotation so um, it's hard to compare all nine to each other 
um, and even just a lot of seasonal variations and stuff, trying to compare plant tissue tests didn't, hasn't really lended anything fantastic, but there's a lot of, of interesting soil test information. And we've looked at your standard six inch deep soil tests. And then we also every year are doing soil samples at depth where we do sandled standard soil tests here six inches and then we'll also go six to 12 and 12 to 24 inches just to demonstrate that these nutrients are also farther down in the soil that you don't just look at kind of the that top six inch plow area and the biggest change that stands out in almost all these guys places is organic matter um, some of them are still tilling a little bit um, a lot of them have really cut it down or have even found their whole operation going like, oh, maybe I can go and only have to till when I need to or every three years or so. Um, but they're all cover cropping. We've got a lot of them in kind of rolling it down and planting into it. Some are planting in green. But by using that cover crop and leaving it down and having that residue, we've seen soil organic matter levels go way up for almost everybody. Even in some of them are in like the upstate of South Carolina, which is a kind of a loamier soil. And then probably a little over half the guys are in very sandy soil in the coastal plains of the state. And it doesn't seem to matter what they're starting with. Everybody is having their organic matter levels go up. For people listening to this or watching this soil organic matter, I think people can understand it near the surface. <clears throat> when you get a lot of residue on top that gets worked into the surface just through natural processes, but the deeper down soil organic matter What's actually happening biologically below the soil to increase soil matter at depth? Is this just roots that are in the soil that have now, you know, the plants stopped growing, the roots are left in the soil? Is that how organic matter is being built in the soil? Where is the rise in organic matter on the soil test coming from when you think about what's actually happening in the soil? Um, Various ways that it's getting in the soil. The, the first one being, and, and the one that I think is most related to cover cropping practices and eliminating your fallow periods is that, um, yeah, your plants have roots and those go to various steps in the soil, but there's a lot of plants need a lot of nutrients to grow and they don't have access to a lot of those on their own. And so through photosynthesis, plants use sunlight, carbon dioxide to make sugars and they use that for their own energy to grow, but, but what they do is they send a lot of that sugar down into their roots and it's exuded out at their roots to attract kind of, I don't want to say symbiotic, it's kind of a symbiotic relationship, but they attract these different microbes that they know are capable of breaking down and providing them with those kind of nutrients and the forms of nutrients that they need. And so as these roots are penetrating down in the soil, they're recruiting all of these microbes and by pushing those sugars out that's you know a sugar is an organic material that's going out there it's it's fostering the growth of bacteria and fungi and when there's bacteria and fungi present there's going to be other stuff that eats bacteria and fungi present and it just is the start of this incredibly large ecosystem of living things that are all organic in nature and so as those things live and die and eat and and excrete things like all of that is increasing the organic components that are in your soils and so that's you know as far as like the how does that get in deeper the plant roots is definitely a primary way but you also have to look at when you roll a cover crop down or bush hog it and you leave a residue on top um, over time that residue disappears and what's happening is that's breaking down it's, it's being um, degraded by microbes on the surface and that is also going down into the soil um, kind of through that microbial metabolism as well and, and some things run off you know rainwater things like that I'm not saying that every ounce or piece of organic matter from a residue is going to go down into your soil but a lot of it does like if you have a healthy soil ecosystem it's going to break stuff down faster and it goes into the soil quicker so I having cover crops, having cover crops kind of moves that sunlight energy and carbon dioxide in the form of sugars into your soil. And that is pushing and promoting organic matter 
in the soil. And then when you terminate that cover crop and leave the, the stuff on the surface, you're also allowing all of that material the opportunity to go back into the soil as an, an organic form that can be kind of eaten and decomposed and used by all the, the living pieces in that soil. Do you have a sense of organic matter contribution applied at surface versus at depth? One thing I see come up a lot is people, you know, they'll suggest adding on a small scale compost, <laughs> on a larger scale manures to the surface. And sure, you're putting a lot of organic matter at the soil surface. Do you, do you know how much maybe that is increasing organic matter relative to how much organic matter is being increased below the surface via root, micro, root and microbial activity? Like is, is the underground portion one to one? Do you think with surface is it two to one? Is it ten to one? Do you have any sense of where that ratio might be? You know, I I really don't. I really haven't kind of looked at the comparison over time of kind of like surface to to roots or or even examining different crop or cover crop species, like how deep those roots go, how deep should we look? Um, I I'm, I really couldn't say what that would be. Mm -hmm. um, but in adding, whether it be compost or manures to the surface, um, you know, there's there's some nutrient value to that and organic matter in that. But a, a lot of the benefit from both of those things is, is also kind of inoculating your soils with with good or beneficial microbes. Um, and so, if you put them on the surface with some amount of organic matter from that material, it's going to promote their growth, and then they'll be able to continue kind of migrating down into the soil and become a part, you know, a, an active, productive part of that ecosystem. So you're not, by adding compost in manures, you're not, or you shouldn't just look at it as adding a nutrient supply or an organic matter supply. You're also kind of inoculating that soil with other good microbes that can, can kind of help keep that system productive and balanced and cycle those nutrients. At, at various levels in the soil profile. And knowing that we're building soil underground via the cover crop activity, how how critical is the no-till part of it? On the plots that you've seen where farmers are still doing tillage, do you see a slower increase in organic matter because the tillage is you know, speeding up microbial activity, which is volatilizing some of that organic matter, burning it off? versus the no-till cover crop plots, are they increasing at a steadier rate because you're not seeing this buildup and then a dip with tillage? Um, that's, it's hard for me to say if, if, if we were looking at soil tests kind of before and after tillage events and doing it more frequently throughout the year related to, to when those events were happening, I think we would definitely see more of that fluctuation. Um, but we do, with this project and, and a lot of the projects we do, we're basically doing annual or biannual sampling on places. Um, the same times, typically around um, late October or November here. And then again in March and April. Um, and I haven't seen anything stand out from that. But I, I do think that if we, if we kind of had a before and after sample, like a before planting and an after planting soil sample, or we were looking at the, the biological aspect or the organic matter, that there would certainly be influences from the, the physical disturbance of tillage, especially in, you know, when, if it's following a cover crop where you've got this diverse cover crop and their root systems promoting a diverse ecosystem, you go in and basically just kind of demolish that whole community. Um, I, I think there's definitely going to be a difference. We just haven't done that that frequent of a of a sampling event following tillage like before and after tillage you know, knowing that thought or thinking along that thought process and and knowing some of the research that you've done if i give you two choices no till <laughs> and fallow or cover crop with tillage which one do you think could build soil better over the long term In other words, is there is there a worse evil here? Is tillage worse than fallow? 
Uh, I obviously I, I, you want them both. You want yeah. you want the opposite of both. You want no till and cover crops. But if, if somebody does have to pick or choose, which would you rather have? Till it. That's that's tough. I think if it was me, and this is this is opinion, like don't anybody listening say, oh, I'm gonna do this because Gabe said it. Um, I I think I would go um, diverse cover crops and till, and then maybe maybe hope that I would have the mindset of maybe minimizing that tillage or, or something along the lines and maybe not necessarily doing the a, a super intense deep tilling that maybe I had been or, and maybe being able to adjust that. Um, but I think going no till without cover crops can, can lead to some other um, issues that might not be great that might might deter somebody from wanting to stay in just that but i think if you have the cover crops you're building that community you're, you're still putting stuff back in you're just kind of ruining and rebuilding every time you till what would be your worry in a no-till no cover crop model like what are some of those potential negatives that you might see crop up uh if, you know if if you're you're no tilling you're still going to be doing a lot of you know planting and and amendments to your soil you're still running your tractors and equipment on your soil but if you don't have roots in there in the off seasons when it's normally fallow I, I just worry that that can kind of create more compaction issues if you don't have a, a diverse even a diverse cash crop rotation you know if somebody's doing corn and the corn cotton rotation or, or something that's kind of the same thing over and over again and leaving it fallow I, I think that's going to cause a lot more downstream compaction problems and, and infiltration issues versus if you have a cover crop in those roots are going to be able to kind of go down and penetrate and kind of be a, a tillage for you to kind of help break up some of the compaction create opportunity for um, poor space and better soil structure so that you're not going to have those problems down the line but then again, you know, when, when that happens and then you go in and you till it, you ruin what was already there. So it's, um, you know, kind of a double-edged sword. But I, I do think that, that no-till without anything else, without cover crop, is can, can potentially be a tough one. I guess if you go back to those NRCS principles, the five ones of soil health, I mean, if you're not keeping the living root in the soil, <laughs> you're not keeping a cover over the soil, and you're not having diversity in the soil so i mean by by going no-till fallow you're kind of removing three of those five right there while only really observing one out of the five Sorry. oh no-till fallow because you're not creating that cover and the diversity and right yeah mm -hmm. yeah anyway, and tying this into nutrient scavenging nutrient recycling i mean you did an actual study on this and you wrote about this it's not yet published but but you looked at some winter wheat plots that had four different treatments, no-till, no-till with cover crops, till and tilled with cover crops, this study. And I realize it's a limited sample size. It's over a small <clears throat> period of time. But if you could extrapolate this and, and hypothesize and think about a, a practical example of a farmer applying nitrogen in their fields, Based on what you saw in these four different types, again, no-till, no-till with cover crops, tilled, tilled with cover crops, what what could you know a farmer expect? Is it something where if I'm putting nitrogen on a tilled field, I'm seeing less of it held, scavenged, and recycled for the crop that might follow it, and meaning it's going through the ground, ending up in the groundwater, and the more regenerative systems are holding the nitrogen? Is that what the data is starting to kind of tell you? Um, it's tough to say that here. We didn't really use nitrogen or any type of fertilization as a, a variable in this. Um, it was the same throughout everything. And I believe there was just a, you know, a pre-emerged nitrogen application um, and then one, um, one application during the crop, but it was even for all of them. Um, and I can't even remember what, you know, what that form was from 2017 but i i don't think at least the the data that we analyzed here can say much about that but but aside from the study just knowing what kind of tillage does 
to especially that the surface of that soil is you're you're creating more oxygen to the microbes in the surface and so i think you mentioned it earlier when you talk about that kind of burst of metabolism and, and breaking up organic matter so if you're applying nitrogen and tilling you're going to have that burst of microbial activity because you've got more microbes with access to pore space and oxygen at the surface where you just tilled and they're going to chew everything up and if nitrogen tends to be a limiting reagent in microbial metabolism so if you apply nitrogen to that too these guys are just going to like consume and consume and consume and burn it up um but i don't you know so so it may get burned up but i don't think that's going to affect the soil's ability to like hold it as far as run and stuff i think you're just going to have more opportunity for microbial consumption of that material before it's going to have a chance to really get into the soil and and stay there and, and be something that can provide to a growing germinating seed so if you given that if you think about the study and the results that you've got to date are there things that we can start to think about when we think about traditional practices versus more regenerative practices based upon some of the results that you've seen in this study? Um, just from a very basic standpoint, looking at this study and, and what I got out of it, it, it just shows at a genetic level in your soil that it has the capability of providing nitrogen um, or of, of cycling and recycling nitrogen, re, you know, to some extent in every single one of those plots. So if you till, that that tends to have kind of a, it didn't outperform anything else. But these other levels of the regenerative practices, in, in some ways, you know, not necessarily every step of the nitrogen cycling process, but it, in, a, in a handful of those processes, outperformed the tilled ones. And so by moving into these regenerative practices you're giving your soil more of an opportunity to to do the work itself and provide for your crop rather than you having to do the work yourself by putting something synthetic down and so if you're if you're doing these regenerative practices you're already at least to some degree thinking about your soil health i think and so if you this study can kind of show like yes this is this is happening like this is is creating a genetic benefit in my soil it has more potential to do this thing therefore maybe i can put less nitrogen down because it's being provided to the plant by the ecosystem that i'm fostering through these practices it's interesting and i've talked to a lot of people on the conventional side of ag and they are deeply rooted in the we're going to need to apply nitrogen chemicals and they're they're trying to reduce application as best as they can but they still think hey you're always going to have to apply it going out on a limb looking at these studies looking at what you know not as a prescription but this is you thinking hypothesizing do you think you could grow a lot of our common cash crops in a regenerative system without adding nitrogen in the form of whether that's an organic or inorganic additive so if it's if it's a legume cover crop fine we're not going to count that but you're not going to put chicken manure on and you're not going to put uh, ammonium nitrate on the field i i think it I think it can be done with the crops that we have. I think kind of the scale and speed at which agriculture productivity wants to go now would be slowed down. I don't I think we would would maybe have to adjust density and you would def there would definitely have to be differences in rotations to increase diversity, but I I think if you kept things the same like only focusing on or if a farmer is only a row cropper is only growing kind of the the big three, I think it's tough. I think you have to change things up. We have to think about other other crops, other things we can grow and that are obviously still gonna be productive and, and go towards your bottom line. Um, 
So that would be the harder part, implementing cover crops and then implementing other cash crops and changing things up. Um, I think it's much more feasible in that scenario. Um, but if a, if, a, if a row cropper that's just grown the big three wants to try and do that without nitrogen supplementation, even regeneratively, I think it's going to be really tough. I think you have to increase diversity beyond kind of the, the staple crops or whatever the term was that, that you used. Yeah, so instead of just looking at this new bushel per acre record, which I think in corn they're, they're predicting like 181 bushels per acre in corn this year, and that's that would be like a new record, just <clears> continuing <throat> looking to creep that up over time, you got to maybe look at different metrics, building soil, increasing soil microbiology, increasing diversity, mm-hmm. and, and maybe not getting that one huge corn yield of maybe you have 120 bushels, but yeah. you're also getting another second crop out of it. So your, your cumulative yield is bigger than your, your single crop. Yield. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Or, you know, and, and even looking at, at mixing things up like intercropping and, and kind of planting things, you know, in row of other things kind of at the beginning and end of the season, like there, you know, there are other, other ways that I think some fringe guys are just starting to get into that, that may be a way that we can, can still keep our a, a general, annual productivity up without necessarily focusing entirely on a, a corn a high super high corn yield or or cotton yield or whatever it is like there's ways that you can incorporate other things where your operation on a whole from an economic standpoint is still thriving and you're still producing while also still fostering a diverse and healthy soil ecosystem different systems, more crops, more carbon into the ground. And, and that's been another b- big focus of yours is focusing on carbon sequestration through agriculture. And I think that's one thing that a lot of people, I don't want to say they even take it for granted. They're just not even thinking about it as a yield mm-hmm. from a crop. Like it's always measured by what I harvest. You're not measuring really the residue that you leave on the ground or the carbon that you put in the ground. <clears throat> but given the work that you've done in this, how do you view agriculture as a tool to sink carbon into the ground? I think it has such a massive potential. Um, and if you would have asked me that question four years ago, I probably wouldn't have really had much of an answer for you. But um, shortly after I started on doing this work with Buzz, he kind of sat down and he's like, we have these multiple years and, and hundreds of soil samples worth of data from all these different projects that we kind of clumped together. And we're like, what can we find from this? And one thing that stood out like, like a spotlight when we started looking at it was the organic matter levels. And so we have about 500 um, sites that we've looked at that and and started measuring soil like standard soil tests and organic matter from the point that they that these guys started implementing multi-species cover crops on their land and so we broke it down into sites that had been under cover crops for two years another group for three years and another group for four years so we could kind of see what that transition into cover cropping looked like and when we looked at the soil organic matter levels um, even in sandy soils in South Carolina, where a lot of people think that you cannot build the organic matter, uh, we saw like really significant increases across the board in soil organic matter just from using cover crops. Some of these sites were tilled, some were no-till. The other management practices were highly variable, but they all had just started cover cropping at the time that we started sampling. And so seeing those numbers all go up was really exciting. And so um, in the paper I wrote about it, I, I very very loosely kind of calculated that into what does that mean as far as the amount of carbon that's coming that those cover crops are pulling out of the atmosphere and putting into the soil, and kind of what does that look like for the state of South Carolina? And we had numbers, kind of a a pounds per acre per year of organic matter change, range from 730 pounds per acre per year to 2,700 pounds per acre per year in the four-year long study. Um, And that kind of calculates loosely to um, 400 to 1,500 pounds of carbon per acre per year that were moved, you know, from the atmosphere 
we put back into the soil through those those plant root exudates and the plant material and the cover crop breaking down and going back into the soil. And so based on um, the census data of 1.9 million acres of farmland in the state, I just kind of use that vague number to calculate if, if all that farmland had started cover cropping, how would the, and, and, and we used our kind of average numbers that we saw just from our 500 samples. So it's a, you definitely can't extrapolate that out accurately to the whole state. But if these numbers are loosely correct, we would be looking at an average farm size in South Carolina is 197 acres. We would be looking at 50 to 156 tons of carbon per year moved from the atmosphere to the soil. Tons. And statewide, that would be half a million to one and a half million tons back into the soil from the atmosphere just from putting cover crops in. Pretty remarkable when you think about it as a, it's kind of a free lunch, right? Because you're getting all the benefits that you have a cover crop. Yeah, exactly. For the crop, the cash crops that you want to grow later on. If, if you think about that, is there a point where things start to slow down in terms of banking that carbon? In other words, can the soil only hold so much? And isn't the whole point of putting organic matter into the soil to use it? to stimulate biology for the crops that you want to grow. So in theory, I mean, we can't grow organic matter infinitely in the soil. No. So does it hit an upper limit? Because at a certain point, like that, you, you want to trade that organic matter that you're putting in the soil for nutrients that the crops can use, or is then it just caught in the cycle? It's being used, but then it's being put right back into the ground. So it's, it's mm -hmm. kind of trapped in that system. And And, and you can always have the goal of trying to put more in than you take out to foster you know that biologically healthy soil and that cycling of nutrients but every every soil type is going to have kind of it's just it's, it's capability to hold what it can hold like you can't you're not going to be able to, to necessarily change that type of soil or change what it is you know a sandier soil is not going to be able to hold or have as much organic matter content as as something that's loamy it's just the the kind of the physical nature of the, sto the soil is still going to limit what it can be or, or that's going to kind of I don't want to say define what it is but but really kind of limit what you can do but there's I, at least from my opinion like I don't think there's there's any wrong you can do by constantly trying to improve those organic matter levels right um, especially if, if you're cropping or grazing you've got to remember that you are constantly taking out every single year as well and that's what we've done for decades is just take and take and take and take. And so maybe we've got decades of work to do to put it back in and put it back in and put it back in. Like in these four or five years that we've been doing this, we haven't seen that limit happen. We haven't seen things stop improving. Um, and gra now granted, if you're looking at a soil organic matter test where these in improved from, say, 2% to 2.2%. Which is still a ten percent increase overall increase in your organic matter content. So that's hugely significant. But we're not jumping from like one percent to five percent. But all these these because it's in a percent, it seems like it's such a small increase. You know, you've only increased by 0 0.2, but that's you know four hundred pounds an acre of carbon. So yeah, and it, it is like a ten percent increase if you do go from two to two point two. Is that is that significant in terms of biological activity? And is that significant in terms of how plants are going to perform in that soil to give people some perspective? Because like you said, you could say, well, I mean, it's only 0 0.2 up. Like, does that even matter? I, I, if, you, if you look at it as far as that organic matter is microbe food. And so that is, you know, in this study, 700 to 2,700 pounds per acre per year. So an, an additional 2,700 pounds an acre of, of good, like kind of healthy food for your soil microbes, then, then how much more are they going to be able to perform those, say those nitrogen cycle functions that we were talking about earlier? Like if, if you're able to foster a bigger and healthier community by just having more food for them, um, you have potential for a lot of other beneficial outcomes. Um, be, because we kind of put all these different 
studies together to do this organic matter measure. It, I can't tell you what what the the yield or, or production outcomes of all of these were. Um, so I don't I, I didn't relate this directly to kind of conventional yield outcomes. But I think it's it's a fair assumption to say that if if we're providing a healthy healthy food for microbes on top of the fact that you're providing the cover crops for them that's creating the environment for them as well um, that you're going to see beneficial outcomes maybe not immediately in your yield outcomes but you're going to see your soil structure start to improve you're going to start to see your infiltration rates improve um, and, and other kind of soil aspects like that maybe not directly in a couple years into your crop but you're going to be hugely benefiting your soil and that over time is going to lead to production benefits now, I know this isn't your area of expertise, but what are your thoughts on this? If you look at conventional ag, that's closer to a sterile soil than a robust soil in terms of the microbial community. There's obviously microbes in the soil, but there isn't, you know, they're not performing at the highest level, and maybe there isn't a wide diversity of them. Do you find or do you think that if you provide the conditions for microbes to thrive, that microbes will come back? microbes will show up, microbes will populate the soil, microbes will build that community, <clears throat> or do you have to go the extra step of doing different things to try and put microbes back into the soil? I think that you will have success in doing the measures and they will kind of come back on their own. Um, an example of, of kind of how that can happen is that that every different plant kind of knows or has its own microbes, soil microbes that it knows are going to be able to, to provide it with the nutrients that it needs in the form that it needs. And so it will, ex those roots will secrete and exude a particular type of sugar or carbon source that it knows that that bacteria or fungi is going to like. And so it's trying to attract those particular things and they come back. And in, in an entire soil ecosystem, kind of the way microbes work is if they're um, their food source or their kind of healthy, happy ecosystem starts to go away, they, they basically kind of make spores or kind of preserve versions of themselves that stay in the soil and will last for a long time. And then when the conditions are right for that thing to grow and be happy again, they'll come back. And they, you know, they grow and reproduce so much more rapidly than 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 humans and other things do. So, so those changes in bacterial and fungal populations occur much more rapid than, than things that we see on the surface. And so by creating conditions that are favorable to these various types of beneficial microbes is all we need. Inoculating them through compost or manures is absolutely beneficial. Um, but that, that, good complex diverse environment can come back on its own if you are increasing the diversity on the end that we can control you know by increasing your crop diversity by increasing cover crops by not destroying those ecosystems with tillage you're going to allow the opportunity for them to come back in a way that's going to benefit your your crops yeah that that's great to hear because it it makes things a little easier for anybody taking on these practices. You can easily put cover crops in the ground. It's a lot harder to get all those microbial species into the ground. So if you can plant the cover mm -hmm. crops, know that, hey, they're, they're dormant, they're there, or they'll, they'll show up however they show up, that's great. Now, if you do all these things to improve your soil, eventually, at some point, you're probably going to be measuring the soil and what's in that soil. And one thing I found really interesting was the paper that you wrote comparing soil test methods. And I found it fascinating because I didn't even realize there was different methods of testing the soil. So can you, can you talk about that paper, why you thought that was important to compare two different soil testing methods and, and really outline the differences between those two methods and why one might be superior to another? Absolutely. Um, there, are, there are lots of different tests and ways that you can use to, to measure your soil. Um, a lot of them that are commonly used are 
pretty strictly chemical or physical in nature by looking at your infiltration or your soil structure, looking at the physical properties, and also to, you know, standard soil tests that use different types of, of harsh acids to extract nutrients and look strictly at the chemical component of your soil, like what is the, the phosphorus, potassium, magnesium levels in the soil, and, and, and experiments for decades have been, been done to determine, you know, based on these soil test rates and plant uptake rates, like that's what's, that's what's used to determine fertilizer, fertilizer rates that people get recommended by all sorts of, of you know, land-grant universities and industrial ag places like that. So there's lots of different ways, and there, there are different extractants that are used on different soil types. Um, the Malik 1 extractant is used commonly here in South Carolina, and that's what I used in this um, paper that I'm working on. And that's what we use, you know, all the time. Our land-grant university here uses that. That's where we send our samples to, to get soil tested, and that's the way that we look at things almost every single time. But what's lacking in those is is really any aspect of what is happening biologically in the soil. You know, you can you can look at a mic look at soil in a microscope, and there are certain things that are big enough that you can tell what they are. But when it comes down to bacteria, they're so small that it's it's hard for most you know advanced microscopists microscopists to be able to tell what these things are or or exactly calculate what they're doing or, or what their function is. And so there are these other kind of soil health tests or biological soil tests that, that can measure other things that act as a proxy for soil biology. Um, one of them being like the Solvita CO2 burst test measures um, a 24 hour or four day carbon dioxide, which is, is used to kind of determine the microbial activity in your soil. You dry soil and then you re-wet it to stimulate microbial activity and you measure how much carbon dioxide those microbes have respired. Because just like us, most of them need oxygen and then we breathe out carbon dioxide. So do they. So if we quantify how much carbon dioxide is in there, um, it, and it's kind of something that you can use comparatively over time, you can see if your microbial activity is increasing or decreasing. Um, and that CO2 burst test is part of the Haney soil health test, which looks at, which uses a, a different combination of weak acids that are meant to mimic acids that, that plant roots use to kind of make nutrients available. And it also looks at the water extractable nutrient content of the soil, which is more representative of what's available to microbes. You know, because there's nutrients that are, are locked up in organic matter that are locked up in, you know, parent material like rocks and stuff that can be broken down and exposed with harsh acids, but they're not in, in that actual soil ecosystem aren't really available for anything to use. Um, so, so part of looking at this test and comparing these two testing methods was to see you know, what, what's the the better way for us to look at it. Like, are we measuring the right thing by looking at chemicals? Are we measuring the right thing by looking just at the biology? And so looking at the, the various aspects of these two tests over um, three years here and six crop rotations, and we kind of used not only those soil tests, but also the, the fertilizer recommendations that came from both of those soil tests to see how much fertilizer was really necessary in these systems and then which which of those recommendations were more accurate at predicting a, a real observable yield that we could actually get in the, the sandy soils that we were in? If that makes sense. So if you if you take a more traditional, I don't want to say traditional, it's the wrong word. I, I don't know the right word, and you can maybe correct me. But if you do a soil test that's based on this chemical analysis, where we're just going to really test the nitrogen, the phosphorus, the potassium, et cetera, all the little minerals that are in our soil. And we have a regenerative soil, like where we're trying no-till, we're trying cover cropping. <clears throat> are we potentially getting an inaccurate picture of what's in the soil or what our soil needs? Um, I would definitely say yes, it's potentially inaccurate, but at the same time, I don't really know what's accurate. And that was kind of part of of comparing these two. Like I, I compared the 
the Haney test that, that is aimed at the more biological aspect and com compared that to the standard one that's focused on chemistry. And they, they tell me different things, but in, in looking at these and correlating all these soil test numbers from both soil tests to the yields we got, there was certain times where one test was maybe more accurate in in determining fertilize, like fertilizer rates than the other, but the other was better at different yields. Like they, they both are telling us different things, but it almost led to more questions because there wasn't, neither one was like a magic bullet that yeah. it was telling us like, oh, this is what I need. Like you, there's, there's useful information from both for sure. Um, but it really kind of continues to make me question like, is the way that we're looking at soils or trying to quantify these things in the soil, like, are we really looking at it the right way? And at the same time, that's also why I got into the metagenomic study to start looking directly at the biology to see if that's a better way. Um, and that's going to take some more time and, and further down the line for me to, to really better understand that and link that to your conventional, not sorry, not conventional, but our, you know, typical production outcomes and the things that farmers are interested in. Um, but there's just so many different ways we can look at what's in the soil. And it's, it's, all, it's all useful to some extent, but we can't always do every single soil test and pull it all together. So it's, it's really an experiment of like, what's going to tell us the most information, what's going to be the most useful. And it's hard for me to say this was better than this, um, based on the information I got, because somewhere, you know, the Haney test was accurate at kind of these more feasible yield outcomes that we see in the coastal plains of South Carolina, but the land grant university that we got the standard soil test from like the chemistry based one was way more accurate at fertilizer recommendations and, and actual yield outcomes for people who were trying to get that higher end yield. So if you compare, if you take the two soil tests that you compare, and in, in they're part of a soil testing toolkit. How many other potential tests are in that toolkit for looking at these types of values around soil? So you look to, are there more in that toolkit? Yeah, there's a lot more. And we're, we're actually hoping to get funding on a project that's a couple of years, two or three years long, I think. Um, Buzz and I in the soil lab to, to test more of those on the same lands to, to not only test them, but also to, to see to use various soil testing methods during the process of transitioning from conventional to regenerative. Mm -hmm. So not only like in a conventional system, which tests are telling us the most useful information, but also in a regenerative or as you're making that transition, like in, in a conventional system where it's more focused on tillage and fertilizer inputs, maybe the chemistry based test is going to give you information that's more useful to that system but if you're trying to go regenerative maybe a different test is going to give you more useful information since you're not looking just at chemistry you're looking at biology and so hopefully that the ball gets rolling on that project and, and we can really start to see like looking at more than just two what right. what's the best thing to look at at on a whole scale of management practices so for somebody who's trying to grow regeneratively, and they're getting soil tests, they could potentially, not definitely, but potentially be getting a soil test that's a misfit for their farming management system. I think so, yes. Yeah. You could get a soil test that says you have this much or you don't have this much of a nutrient, say phosphorus, um, in your soil. But if you have a healthy biological system and, and lots of hyphal networks that are able to go deeper and beyond your plant roots, they have the capability of, of pulling that nutrient from other places and giving it to those plant roots versus a conventional system may not have that and you may have to supplement it more because you don't have that kind of scavenging and that partnership that a healthier biological ecosystem would. So, so I'm thinking if I'm a regenerative grower and I'm practicing no-till, I have cover cropping, and we assume that a lot of these things that we've talked about in this interview are happening, you're getting nitrogen 
or you're getting nutrient scavenging, you're getting nutrient recycling to some degree in the system because the biology is working. You're adding organic matter, which is stimulating that biology, which is helping us in a lot of ways. It's freeing up nutrients that are locked up in the soil, mm -hmm. parent matter, the organic matter, all that type of stuff. Could I make the argument and just say a soil test is just a waste of time and energy? If I can't really tell if the information is accurate, like it might be useful, it might not be useful. You know, well, what about this scenario? You're saying we can't quantify what that is, but if you continue to get your soil tests regularly as you are go doing these things anyway, you're doing these regenerative practices, that's providing you with the data. Okay. So you can see over time, like, you know, and maybe you, maybe you, you can, you can see your, uh, your farm or your productivity increasing. You can visibly see your soil getting healthier. If the soil test that you're getting is showing no change, then, then you can probably conclude like, yep, this soil test is not telling me anything worthwhile and maybe try a different one. And I think that, that if you're in that system and you, you look at the more biological soil tests, that might be more of interest to you. The it, it's looking at water extractable nutrients, more like bioavailable nutrients. I think we don't know exactly what those is. The like what is the best part of that to use for fertilizer recommendations and stuff like that's something that I'm still questioning. But if you're doing it, I think there's still a huge benefit in getting those soil tests and just looking at that data your own over time. And then you can, if you do that for five years and you go back and you look at five years of soil test data, maybe you completely ignored all of the fertilizer or whatever recommendations that came with that. That's fine. But if you go back, you, you know how your productivity was or wasn't over that time. And you go back and look at that soil test, you can probably see what's, what's happening. Like what is in indicating what you saw or what was a good indicator, what was not. So I think that, by doing soil tests, at least annually, if not more, um, that creates an opportunity for you to quantify what's happening on your system. I think that's a great point. Yeah, no, that makes a ton of sense. So I guess it's if you're going to get a soil test, one, try and make sure the soil test matches up with the system that you're going with, and then know what soil test you're actually getting, where I think a lot of times, I mean, I've yeah. done soil tests on just a garden level where you send it away, and I really don't know what exact testing method they're getting mm -hmm. you know they're, i'm just getting mm -hmm. that result so know what they're getting and then i mean even when within the biological geared soil testing are there a few options and would it be worth you know maybe you get a couple of those done and you get a couple of those done each time so now you're essentially plotting those and you can say okay well if this one's high this one's low well here's where the mean ends up mm -hmm. this is probably where i'm at yeah, so you could start to be a little more like nerdy scientists like me and get multiple tests and compare them. Um, unfortunately, biological tests are more expensive than the chemical tests. Um, and and they're, they can, what are some names not, for that for, for for people listening if they want to get biological soil tests? Just to repeat that, like what, what should they be looking at if they're going to a lab? Um, the the Haney soil health test is what I used in this paper. We also very frequently do PLFA tests which is an acronym for phospholipid fatty acids. And that basically measures a particular cell membrane protein that's in microbes. And it's a cell membrane protein that kind of degrades relatively quick compared to other ones that may you know, linger in the soil as it kind of turn into another form of organic matter. And so what that indicates is when you're measuring those, you can differentiate between like bacteria and fungi and protists, but because they degrade relatively quickly, you kind of get close to a snapshot of what type, what the microbial profile in your soil was. The, the living microbial part, not stuff that died three months ago and is still, you know, just kind of a dead shell of a cell in your soil. Like what was, what was at that time, most likely a, a living productive part of that soil. Um, so that was Haney test, PLFA. There are new tests now and I haven't done any of these, but it's one that I think we're going to include. Um, if we get this new project rolling, is looking at different soil enzymes. Um, I don't know much about that, the details of that. Like, I, I want to look more into it and, and kind of get some of that data and, and play with it. But I, I think for now, a, a lot of what people are are doing is the Haney test and um, 
PLFA. PLFA has been around for a while, but I think it's, it's kind of potential usefulness in agriculture is becoming a little more common or at least a little more common to me. So. Yeah. I imagine a lot of these tests are really kind of like <clears throat> from hearing you describe this, we're kind of applying a patchwork solution to this. Like we just don't understand enough about the complexity of the soil and all the connections under there. Like it's exactly. so complex that you're trying to come up with a test to measure it, but you don't really understand what you're even trying to measure in the first place. So yeah, as yeah. we know, know more about the soil, we can build a better test. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like we, you can't, it, it's just too complex to be able to start, try and pick like where in this complex web, like where are we going to measure this, you know, and you can measure it, like we can measure stuff, but how that, like, what does that tell us in a system that's so complex? You know, if it was as easy as, um, made you like maybe like a hydroponic system where you have water and you have to add these things to make plants grow in it like that's easier but you have a soil ecosystem where there's all this other stuff happening there um that's just way beyond what we can understand you know we can't we can't see most of it visibly so that makes it harder to understand and and there's so so much influence day to day on weather conditions and temperature and climate and and just your basic starting soil type it's I could find a, a perfect answer maybe for for what's the most important in a sandy coastal plain soil in South Carolina. And it could that same thing could be useless in a different soil, you know, where a different you know, that the complexity of that is is different based on what it's physically starting at, you know. Hi everybody, thanks for watching. Subscribe here to get the latest from the show. Also be sure to check out some of the great clips and watch the full interviews right here on In Search of Soil.